Hello, this is U.S. Congressman Alex Mooney. Thank you for joining my live telephone town hall meeting this afternoon. It's an honor to represent you. If you're on this call, you're in one of the 17 beautiful counties that comprise the 2nd District of West Virginia, and I represent you from one of those counties. I'm calling you today live from our district office in Martinsburg. Uh, I live in Jefferson County with my wife and three kids. I represent Jefferson, Berkeley, Morgan, Hampshire, Hardy, Pendleton, Randolph, Upshur, Lewis, Braxton, Clay, Kanawha County, Putnam, Roan, Jackson, Calhoun, and Work Counties. Those are the 17 counties in the 2nd District. There's three of us uh, congressmen in West Virginia. This afternoon, I'm calling you, the constituents across that district, to talk about the coronavirus epidemic and the response. Uh, we are joined by Dr. Matthew Simmons, who's been with us before. He's an infectious disease expert. Dr. Tom Takubo, uh, who's also the majority leader of the uh, West Virginia State Senate. Uh, Paul Axelson, who's the West Virginia Internal Revenue Service, IRS, Congressional District Liaison, and also Kim Donahue, who's our West Virginia Small Business Administration uh, Charleston Branch Manager. Uh, they'll all make some uh, opening remarks and help me answer the questions throughout this, this call. We would like to hear from you. This is an interactive call. You are welcome uh, to ask questions. To do so, you may press star 3 on your phone at any time. Again, press star 3 if you have a question to get you into the question queue. Again, this is U.S. Congressman Alex Mooney, and you are currently joining my live telephone town hall meeting on the coronavirus. I want to thank you for joining me this afternoon. Uh, we're eager to hear feedback uh, from you, uh, my constituents, and give you an update on the coronavirus response by the federal government. I do remain in continuous contact with the Trump administration, working remotely frequently, although today, as I mentioned, I'm actually in my Martinsburg office, uh, working in the district office, and my Charleston office is open and fully running as well. We've actually been quite busy with constituent cases the past uh, since this coronavirus hit. I'm proud to report to you that less than in the 10 days in April, the federal government has delivered the following items to West Virginia, 12,295 face masks, 61,700 surgical masks, 1,600 eye and face shields, and 2.7 million surgical gloves. Again, this is U.S. Congressman Alex Mooney, and you are currently joining my live telephone town hall meeting. Please press star 3 at any time to get into the question queue. Again, star 3 to get into the question queue to talk live on the line with me or one of the guests. Congress has now passed four relief packages. I went down to D.C. just uh, was a week and a half or so ago for the fourth one, where we found out, we figured out a way, despite the, the, works, the work uh, from home orders, Congress did figure out a way to get 400 members of Congress into the U.S. Congress and vote to do our jobs. So I was proud that I went and did that and voted for that bill. Uh, Congress first acted by passing more than $8 billion in emergency funding. That was the first relief package we, we uh, passed uh, for the coronavirus response. That was funds for the Department of Health and Human Services, including the Centers for Disease Control, to stock up on necessary medical supplies, hundreds of millions of dollars to the National Institute of Health for research and development for vaccines and treatments and tests. And you're hearing a lot about test information, um, and anybody, maybe one of our guests could comment on that. Additionally, I continue to work with President Trump uh, to pass the CARES Act, the Coronavirus Aid, Relief, and Economic Security Act to bolster our health care system and support small business owners. Uh, the, the Small Business Administration already has uh, uh, $1.7 billion in loans to over 14,842 uh, West Virginia small businesses designed to keep people employed during this, during this epidemic time and stop these small businesses from having to close permanently. Funding from this legislation also goes to our rural hospitals and health care providers for support in the fight against COVID-19. Already $309 million has been allocated to medical providers in our state. Uh, $19.6 million nationally has been allocated to the Veterans Affairs Administration and uh, VA, benef VA benefit recipients in West Virginia automatically receive $1,200. Uh, the CARES Act also included stimulus checks for Americans. As of April 17th, the IRS has issued 522,000 payments to West Virginians, totaling more than $984 million. I'm proud to continue to work with President Donald Trump to protect West Virginians during this crisis. 
Again, this is U.S. Congressman Alex Mooney, and you're currently joining my live telephone town hall meeting. Please press star three to get into the question queue uh, and talk live on the line with me or one of my guests at any time. Again, star three to get into the question queue. President Trump has unveiled guidelines to open our great country back up again. This is a three-phased approach that will help state and local official, officials protect American lives while reopening the economy. Governor Jim Justice, I'm sure you've seen this in the news, has his Safer at Home guidelines in effect, and uh, he's, he has a roadmap to reopen our state. We can all continue to do our part and reduce the risk of spreading this virus by following the, the common sense guidelines and good hygiene. Wash your hands, stay home if you're sick, clean and disinfect uh, touch objects, and refrain from touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. If you're over 60, uh, go ahead and stop up, stock up on supplies like medications and groceries. Nationwide testing equipment is now readily available with more rapid results. Uh, when I did this, the first telephone town hall with Dr. Simmons about a month or so ago, it was uh, close to, uh, it just gone from four days to two days to get a test results back, and I understand it's getting quicker and quicker with more advanced, and, I, and kudos to those in the medical community uh, for developing much quicker tests. Again, this is U.S. Congressman Alex Mooney, and you're currently joining my live telephone town hall meeting. You may press star three at any time to get in the question queue. Again, press star three at any time uh, to ask a question. Stay current on health updates with the Centers for Disease Control, cdc.gov. If you're interested in, in my weekly updates, our newsletter is mooney.house.gov. That's M-O-O-N-E-Y, mooney.house.gov. Gov. So let me go ahead and introduce uh, our uh, our guest uh, one at a time. Uh, Dr. Uh, Simmons has been with us before. He's in a Dr. Matthew Simmons is an infectious disease uh, clinic. Uh, he's an expert in in uh, specializing in infectious diseases and closely monitoring developments surrounding COVID-19 in West Virginia. He's out of Martinsburg. So, Dr. Simmons, you want to give us a minute or two of any any uh, information or updates? Sure. I just well, first of all, I want to thank you for your continued support of the state of West Virginia and Washington D.C. The things that you're accomplishing there are really helping us, and we appreciate your efforts. Um, like you said, the testing has become a little bit more available. We're able to test many more people at this time. We were successfully able to test a lot of our daycare workers and nursing home patients in the last week. We do have the availability um, to test healthcare workers and patients who are sick in the hospital, so that availability has increased dramatically. We are participating in a bunch of projects across the state and across the country for remdesivir, which is one of the um, under investigation therapies for that, with Gilead, the drug company that makes it. And so things are much better than they were. We just now are relying on people to do their part. Uh, as West Virginians always do, stick together and protect the state by staying home and observing social distancing. Even as we start to open the state back up, we ask people to use their best judgment and do things carefully and you follow the masking and hand washing guidelines. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Simmons. We'll stay with the doctors here. Uh, Dr. Tom Takubo. Uh, Dr. Takubo is a practicing physician. He also doubles and serves as the West Virginia State Senate. Majority Leader. Uh, he represents South Charleston, where he lives with his three children, as I have three children that I live with up here in Jefferson County. Uh, but Dr. Takubo uh, is uh, widely recognized as having brought the most advanced lung diagnostics and non-invasive treatment options to West Virginia. He's been a health care provider uh, for many years. He's a graduate of Marshall University and the West Virginia School of Osteopathic Medicine. He specializes in pulmonology and critical care. Uh, and, uh, you know, he has, uh, unfortunately, his father passed from black lung disease, and so, uh, he, you know, he's got a special interest in lung cancer-related issues. But, Dr. DeCubo, uh, thank you for joining us. Go ahead, please. Uh, Congressman, thanks for having me on the call, and thanks for all you're doing. Uh, recently, the uh, sure. bill that you guys took up regarding um, Medicare payments has been extremely beneficial, a lot of especially private practice in West Virginia uh, was struggling, and so um, having to do the telehealth bills um, and worrying about reimbursement of those uh, was really affecting practices, so thanks for any and all of that support as well. 
Um, you know, here in Charleston, uh, one of the biggest hospitals in the state, uh, being in the ICU, we've um, probably dealt with 90% of the critical care of COVID cases uh, that's come through our area in Canal County. And so far, everything has been managed uh, very well. We've been able to get adequate amounts of PPE. Uh, luckily, uh, West Virginians did a great job uh, and kept the surge from really ever occurring. Um, we currently have one patient left in the intensive care unit, but they've been there for close to 40 days now. Um, still hanging on. Um, we've had a pretty good success rate. Uh, we've been able to successfully extubate about half of our COVID patients and get them back off the ventilators uh, successfully, much like the rest of the country. Those that um, succumbed to the illness were, uh, you know, 70 and older uh, with uh, comorbidities. Uh, we've had a couple cases below that, but again, had very significant comorbidities. Um, so we're just kind of in waiting now for this second phase. So the, the question mark has been for us is what happens once uh, people, the social distancing stays in place, but people's allowed to get back out. Uh, obviously, they're going to be in, um, as things get more lax, they'll feel more comfortable, probably take more risk. Um, and will there be a surge? Uh, hopefully not. Uh, and then the third question will be when school starts back, uh, will there be a surge then? So. We've uh, been fortunate with the low amounts of patients coming in that we've been able to um, kind of get a system. There's um, hopefully not false confidence, but um, less angst amongst the medical staff uh, dealing with these patients. Um, they've gone into a new normal, I guess, with all the face masks that uh, everyone wears and understanding that anybody could be contagious and, and being very cautious from that front. But um, we stand ready to, to help and continue and support both uh, medically and, and on the legislative side and appreciate all you're doing and, and be happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Cubo. And again, if you're just joining the call, this is U.S. Congressman Alex Mooney doing a, our live telephone town hall meeting. We have several distinguished guests. You may press star three at any time to get in the question queue. We have a lot of questions already. Star three at any time to get in the question queue. Our next special guest uh, joining us this, today for this call is we'll, we'll ask for some, uh, just to say hello, Paul Ax Axelson. He's our uh, Internal Revenue Service IRS government liaison. The IRS is offering tax help for taxpayers, businesses, tax-exempt organizations, and others affected by the coronavirus. They've started sending out the economic impact payments. Paul works as our West Virginia IRS Congressional District liaison, and is he's integral in guiding us through this process with the resources available during this time. And uh, Mr. Axelson, we do already have one question, which is how someone wants to know how he gets their stimulus check. It's a question from Kanawha County. I don't know if you want to cover that in your opening comments, if someone hasn't gotten their check, how they get it. I've been getting that question a lot. So go ahead, uh, Mr. Axelson. Thank you, Congressman. Thank you very much. Just uh, to be very, very brief, I do want to give you a quick rundown of the status of IRS operations at the moment. As you know, we've continued to operate throughout the crisis, and so far we've pumped out about 70 million refunds, that's normal income tax refunds, totaling about $200 billion. At the same time, however, we are not unaffected by this. We did have to shut down a lot of our bulk processing and all of our call sites. That is beginning to come back online. About 12 days ago, we put out a call for volunteers who would be willing to come back in spite of the local lockdown orders, and we got a tremendous response to that. Those folks are getting back into the centers, getting your paper returns processed and other items processed. We did have one setback and then we had an employee test positive and so we had to shut down one site and re-clean it. That's going on now, but the point is we are getting back up to speed with our bulk processing and our telephone operations just as soon as local conditions and safety conditions allow us to do that. Um, your Congressman Mooney, Mr. Mooney, mentioned the economic impact payments and how many have gone out to West Virginia. I think the numbers were 522,000, totaling over $500 million. On a national basis, we have delivered in about the last four weeks, 130 million such payments, totaling over $200 billion. And the big questions that we're getting today are, when is my payment coming and why did I get less than I thought? It is difficult for me to address when it is coming, but I can tell you this much. If you believe that you got less than the full amount to which you are entitled, 
you will be able to claim the additional amount when you file your 2020 tax return. As for when it is coming, as I mentioned, we've delivered about 130 million at last count, and I think that comes from Friday. And we're continuing to deliver them on a weekly basis. I don't know the numbers for this week or last. I'm apologizing for that. And I can't really tell you as an individual when your specific payment is going to come. I apologize for that, but I just don't have that kind of level of insight. With that, I'll turn it back over to you, Congressman. Is there, is there a way, Paul, just real, real quick, is there a way someone just can confirm that it's coming, even if you can't tell them when, that they just know they're in the system and that their check is coming? I've gotten that question a lot. Our office gets dozens of calls a day about that. I apologize. Yes, I meant to cover that. We do have two tools online. One is okay. called the Get My Payment tool. You can find it there if it is scheduled. If it is not yet scheduled and you are eligible, it, the information will be on that tool eventually. It updates every day, by the way, overnight normally. So if you check it today, you don't find anything. It says, for example, status not available. Log off, check it again the next day. Will not update until overnight. Great. You may get also my payment? Eligibility status. Yes, the tool is called Get My Payment. Let me spell it out. G-E-T-M-Y-P-A-Y-M-E-N-T. Get My Payment. Yes. Okay. Dot com. If I if I could, Congressman, uh, dot .gov. Dot .gov, sorry. Dot .gov, dot .gov, okay. Right. Just to back up a little bit, everything that we have and everything that I can tell you, all of you constituents out there, everything that we have is at irs.gov slash coronavirus. It is not there. I don't know it. Great. We post that on our follow-up uh, information. Uh, let's keep going. Uh, Kimberly Donahue is the West Virginia Small Business Administration Charleston Branch Manager. Doing, I know it's a lot of work there to get those business loans out. It's been a very popular program. I think it's working. I'll just tell you from the congressional point of view, uh, we had to decide between speed and a perfect system, and we chose speed. And we got, you know, for a federal government to move this quickly and get this program up and running in literally a matter of weeks is amazingly fast. So there are hiccups along the way. There are individual one-off mistakes that need to be fixed, but I appreciate the Small Business Administration at the federal and state levels moving quickly. Uh, Kimberly Donahue oversees the operations of the branch office, which serves, it's in Charleston, which serves 27 southern West Virginia counties. So Ms. Donahue, please, uh, please go ahead. Thank you, sir. Um, I would just like to give a few quick updates. Um, since round two of PPP, or excuse me, Payroll Protection Program loan processing began back on April 27th, um, it, millions of loans have already been made. Uh, I, I want to say that uh, nearly half a million were made by our smallest lenders, some of those, many of those here in West Virginia. And I would like to underscore that there is still Payroll Protection Program monies available. Um, you know, our systems are processing the loans. The loans that start at the lender. And so we would encourage all eligible small businesses that need the assistance to work with your approved lender and apply. Uh, the other update we have it is that beginning Monday at noon, SBA's Economic Injury Disaster Loan Portal opened uh, again to provide additional funding for agricultural businesses. Um, for more than 30 years, SBA has actually been prohibited by law from providing disaster assistance to agricultural concerns. But as a result of the unprecedented legislation, um, you know, West Virginia farmers, ranchers, other agricultural businesses are now going to have access to that emergency working capital through the Economic Injury Disaster Line. If you want to learn more about that, just go to sba.gov and click on COVID-19. Um, if you already do happen to have an SBA guarantee loan in place, I want to point out, we don't talk a lot about it, uh, but SBA has a special debt relief program going on where SBA will pay your interest and your principal on all up-to-date SBA loans for a period of six months. And if you want to make sure that you're included in that or to be included, please uh, contact your lender. Thank you. All right, thank you. Let's just go right to our first question. And uh, what happened to the mask one? Well, let's 
go that one. And uh, let's go ahead and and start uh, start uh, start taking some questions here. Again, you're you're on with Congressman Alex Mooney. Star three at any time to get in the question queue to ask a question to me or one of the guests. Again, press star three at any time to get in the question queue. We have a Blair in uh, Berkeley County. Go ahead, Blair. Okay, one question that I have is, will we be able to get the antibodies test in sufficient numbers to give a better idea as to the possible infection rate here in West Virginia? So, Congressman Mooney, I'll take that question if you don't mind. Yeah, please please go ahead. Um, West Virginia University Hospital Systems is working, we're preparing to go within the next seven to eight days live with an antibody test. It will be only an IgG, which shows a past infection, not a current infection. The reason that we are not widely distributing, um, supporting that is because IDSA, which is the Infectious Disease Society of America, and the CDC do not know the clinical relevance of a positive IgG test. It can tell you that you've had the virus and been exposed, but not if it's protective, which means that you can't get it again, and certainly not if it's augmentative, which means that if you are exposed to it again, will you have a worse outcome? So while that testing frame is there, we are will be able to do testing for it. We're not sure how to recommend to people whether or not they should get it and what it means if it's positive. We're still waiting for further information from some researchers. But it will be available in the Eastern Panhandle within the next week, likely. Okay, great question, one of many. Uh, again, press star three to get in the question queue. Uh, we have uh, we have another question from Kanawha County. Uh, let's go ahead and and see about maybe Dr. Takubo, since you're down there, you're in Kanawha. Uh, Mary uh, from St. Albans, uh, if you're on, go ahead, Mary. Okay, good. <clears throat> sorry, good afternoon. Um, I'm just saying that are we going to try to enforce wearing masks or encouraging masks? and distancing in these stores because when I go in them, there are people, all kinds of people with no masks on, and they're, they're not social distancing. And I find it offensive because I've been working day and night for two months to help senior citizens make masks and this kind of junk, and I'm wearing down. My patience is wearing down, and I just find it offensive. Is there some way, could we, like, get a fine or something? Or so there will be fines if you don't wear masks when you're out in the public? Well, I mean, what can we do? All right, thank you. That's a good question. Dr. Takubo, why don't you go ahead and try to answer that one about uh, the masks and, and what do we do if someone's not wearing it and what, what's your view on that? Boy, you could have given me an easier question. Huh? <laughs> so, uh, the reality is I, you know, that's something that the governor's office is going to have to tackle. Um, the, the problem you'll have is um, some people may not all have access to the masks. Uh, they may have breathing difficulties, and some people complain that the masks uh, makes their breathing even more difficult. I mean, we've all seen um, individuals in, in public that you wonder how they're, you know, walking from point A to point B anyways, and then you put a breathing mask, and those are the very ones that should be wearing them. Um, so the answer really is I don't know. Uh, I'll certainly take that back to the governor's office uh, and see what the thought process is on that. I think um, the, probably the best approach really is just to kind of keep re-encouraging and re-asking people to do the right thing and hope they will, knowing that not all will, but if enough do, there will be some uh, I shouldn't say herd immunity, but it, there will there'll be protection for all by the from the most that uh, continues to do the social distancing and, and uh, precautions. And then some of those individuals, too, uh, I guess the question would be, this may be a question for our ID guys, uh, uh, specialist is uh, someone that has already tested positive uh, in his past symptoms, um, you know, technically they, they hopefully will have immunity to this. And so... Um, you never know how many of those individuals may be out and about also, but um, even then, I think probably still uh, social distancing, they could still certainly touch things and pass it to other people that haven't had the disease, so it's still a good idea to social distance. Thank I don't you, think Dr. I can Cubo. exact answer to your question, but it oh. is um, something I'll look into. 
Well, thank you, Dr. Kuba. I know the governor's issuing guidelines. It's, it's masks is one one issue, the social distancing and, and making sure you're washing your hands. I mean, all those things go together, and it may depend on the circumstance uh, of the individual and, and what they're doing. But let's go ahead. Uh, we've got a lot of folks in the question queue. Again, you're live on the line with uh, me, Congressman Alex Mooney, uh, four expert guests. You're currently joining my live telephone town hall meeting. We have a lot of folks in the question queue, but please press star three to get in the question queue if you want to talk live on the line. And I'm going to do another. It's another medical-related question. It's Mary from Spencer, uh, beautiful Roan County. Mary, go ahead. Yeah, I had a question. I want to know if um, how can you tell if your kid has the coronavirus without taking them to a doctor? Dr. Simmons, you want to take a first shot at that? Well, you know, it's a very difficult decision to make because their coronavirus overlaps with a lot of common childhood illnesses as well as influenza. Some of the things that we see particularly like um, conjunctivitis, which is redness or irritation of the eyes, dry cough, shortness of breath, can be really nonspecific in children. And it's more difficult to tell in children because they don't get the severe classical constellation of symptoms. If you do have um, a concern. If your child has a respiratory illness, I would suggest that you at least call your provider. There's some things that you can do without necessarily going into the doctor's office. They can order some tests. They can talk to you about specific signs and symptoms like strep throat can um, look a little bit like coronavirus from time to time. There are some common childhood illnesses, but really without talking to your provider specifically about what the symptoms your child has, it would be very difficult. And I would urge you, if you think that your child has COVID-19 or coronavirus to call your health care provider because there are some cases of child, children doing very poorly. So there's not a good way in short, but I would call your health care provider and see if they felt that your child needed to be tested and or seen. Okay, thank you. Thank you. That was a great question. So uh, let's go ahead to uh, the next one. Again, uh, thank you so much for calling in for this uh, telephone town hall. A lot of meeting out there, a lot of town halls and, and information out there, but it changes so quickly, it's good to do these frequently as possible. So let's go ahead to another question from uh, Charleston in Kanawha, and this is be more business related, and it's Patricia. Patricia, if you're with us, go ahead. Yes, I am. Go Hello ahead. there. Appreciate Hello. this. Um, I was just wondering with the, um, I noticed that certain restaurants that are open, like Tidewater, now, have these people been tested to make sure that they are safely opening up these restaurants and being around people? And what about the cooks and things back there? Do we know anything about the people that are opening up these restaurants? That's, That's a good question. I'm... Go ahead. Yeah. No, I've, I've, you know, I've noticed, <laughs> I've been ordering out a lot myself to try to help these small businesses. We have Kimberly Donahue with the West Virginia Small Business Administration. So she's the one working with these small businesses, whether it's cooks or other folks that, that may be making services. I think maybe Ms. Donahue uh, could first try to address that, like what, what precautions are being taken or are they being tested just to make sure they don't have the virus? I don't know. You want to try that one, Ms. Donahue? Sure, I'll take a quick shot at it. It really depends on the individual business and what the governor's um, uh, reopening plan requires. Again, there's some spacing requirements, et cetera. Uh, you're going to see some changes in our, particularly in our restaurants, but other businesses as we continue to cope with the COVID-19. Uh, but I would fully expect most of our businesses to instruct their await staff to wear masks uh, and or glo and gloves and um, uh, practice social distancing where possible, uh, putting more space between um, our customers as they gradually open their dining rooms back up. Um, you know, a, a, a responsible business, a profitable business, um, they're really the same thing. So if they're being responsible, they're going to make more money, and, and I think that should encourage them all to do the right thing. Thank you uh, for taking that one. We're, we have a lot more questions in the queue. I do want to ask one question of our listeners and, and, and one poll question during this time. Uh, the thing that I get asked a lot and going to have to vote on sooner or later is reopening the economy. And there's a lot of opinions out there. So I'd be curious to know for the folks on the call 
And and for the sake of uh, my my host, thank you so much. We have over 5,000 people listening on this call right now. Uh, My question is, you answer by pushing one or two on your phone. So the question is, when do you want to see the state uh, fully reopen? And the question would be, one, if you think now, now's the time to reopen everything and fully reopen the state, or two, I think it's too soon to reopen. We should do it gradually, maybe reopen at a future time fully. I'd be curious to know your view on that. So, again, if you want to help me out by answering that poll question, what, press one on your phone if we, you think we should reopen West Virginia right now, or two, if you think it's still too soon to reopen fully and we should maybe look at reopening fully at a future time or gradually reopen. Thank you very much. Let's go ahead and take the next question. Um, Again, press star three on your phone to get into the question queue. And let's go ahead to Elkins in beautiful uh, mountainous Randolph County. And we have Vaughn on the line. Go ahead, Vaughn. Yes, sir. I actually have a number of things, but I'm going to make it quick if I can. I want to first thank you for the money because I got it deposited just last week. My question with that is that tax is that going to be taxable income? Yes or no? Um, no, Paul, sir, is that taxable? Not, not taxable. No, it is okay. not, Congressman. Nope. Thank you. Okay. I'm assuming that there'll be tests for those elderly that has been staying home sometime in the future to see if we've been exposed to it or not. Um, that's uh, probable. And then a, a suggestion to help open up better is that for those costs that businesses have to take to open up and become working again, could that be put into tax law to have a um, non-taxable or breaks in their tax year just for one year? It's just an idea to help provide more cash flow. Now, the big question I have, which is broader than that, deals with my experiences from being I'm an Air Force retiree. The medical things that were available for those of us who have been on government medical things, generally, they are limited to what they can prescribe. In my case, was diabetes. And diabetic medicines that they have authorized our old inadequate stuff, they don't even, at least in the VA for a long while, didn't say there was anything else besides that one product to treat, even though I could see on TV advertisement after advertisement. I think that the the governmental agencies that deal with uh, what medicines are listed should be able to open up to something else. I don't want to take up a lot of time, but I ran into where when I first became diabetic or as I identified diabetic, it was through a civilian doctor who was an expert in it. Then due to the fact my COBRA went out, was out, I then had to go to the US Air Force Hospital who could not prescribe that great medicine they gave me was oral, they had to do something else that was pretty good. But then they shut down the Air Force base and I go down to a contract doctor who had to look up what the heck diabetes was in the med- in the medical journal- book that they had there. And then he put me on the least, the, the, the old cheap stuff at which what well, didn't work at all. And then in the VA, I'm getting to where I'm literally hypoglycemic shock for over 12 hours at home, not even knowing anything because I was completely blacked out. And they can't seem to... There was only one try, one other insulin. It... Well, a long story. I don't take insulin anymore because okay. it would kill me. And Th- thank you for that. They, don't, they can't. Let me. They can't prescribe something different, both oral and insulin. Uh, let me say, Vaughn, we have uh, 
I, I presume you're going to the VA or you're available to go to the VA uh, and the, the, the medical team there, thank you for your service in the Air Force, the medical team there can take great care of you. If you have specific issues, anyone, you or anyone on the line is welcome to call our Charleston office at 925-5964 or Martinsburg at 264-8810 if you have a, a specific case or th- something we could help with. Um, but I do appreciate, Vaughn, your, your question and comments. My chief of staff also served in the U.S. Air Force, and we honor our veterans and the VA's office. If you have any problems with them, please call me. I can help you make sure the VA is taking uh, taking a look at your exact situation with your insulin. But as far as your question regarding will seniors be tested, it is not my understanding that all people are going to be tested. When, this, when we fully reopen, whenever that is, it's not my understanding that all people are going to be tested, and, and even seniors. It's people who have... Uh, you know, been exposed to it or have uh, the the symptoms that will be tested, not everybody. Um, At least that's my understanding. But let's go ahead to the next question. Again, uh, the poll question was, do you want to see the state fully reopened right now? One, yes, reopen the state right now. Press two on your phone if you think we should not reopen right now, but reopen gradually at a later time. One, reopen right away. Two, do not reopen yet. Let's go to uh, Retta in Clay County. Retta or Dilly in Clay County, go ahead. Good afternoon. Uh, the guy that that talked to before, uh, my husband's a veteran, and he goes to the VA in Clarksburg, and they are absolutely fabulous. But my question is, uh, when people are tested and they're found positive, are they give are they prescribed medication then, or do they have to get worse before they come back and get the medication? Uh, I was thinking all along that if you were positive, that they should give you the z pack and the tri- trichloramine, trichloramine, and that would have maybe stopped a lot of it. So I would like to know if the doctors were prescribing uh, medicine when they were found uh, positive. So maybe, well, that's, maybe go ahead, yeah. So, ma'am, there have been studies that have come out that have shown that hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin are not as effective as we initially thought. Initially, when those medicines were being um, touted as being good solutions for COVID, it was very early on, and there was what was called anecdotal evidence that some people had experience with it or not. As we go along through the epidemic, we're finding that not everybody responds, and actually there are some pretty significant side effects to hydroxychloroquine, which is um, one of the medicines that was involved. So historically, physicians have always had to balance the risk and benefit of every medication. There are no currently FDA-approved widespread treatments available that are effective for COVID-19. And so we have pushed away from prescribing hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin at this time as there are some studies now that even show that some people may do worse with them. So no, not all physicians were prescribing that medicine at that time. You have to take into account comorbidities, the patient's other medications, and uh, several other things. Uh, But they were being uh, prescribed uh, at the positive uh, uh, when they were found positive. Some people were, not everybody was, because there was not a lot of scientific evidence to support it, and there remains not to be a lot of evidence for it. So, yes, there were some physicians prescribing it, but not everybody, and a lot of those people were being given those medications if they were severely ill in an attempt to stop the progression of the disease. But it did not pan out to work that way. So so you're telling me that that they were, uh, when they were found positive, they were not medicated. They were not given any medication at all. They were sent home to see if they got better or, or worse. No, ma'am, that's not the case at all. For viruses, there are not, there are very few effective regimens, and none of the regimens that we have are effective. So it wasn't that they weren't being prescribed anything. Some people were being prescribed medications if there was a concern of another process. And very early on in the epidemic, people were being prescribed hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin when they were diagnosed. But that was not a consistent practice across the United States because there is no current standard of care for COVID. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. My understanding there are, there are there are treatments in development that would reduce the time for COVID, but as Dr. Simmons said, these things have to be tested on real people to see if they actually work. So 
I, I, I've been on many, many conference calls daily, and our entire country is working double overtime. The pharmaceutical industry, the the uh, you know Centers for Disease Control, these folks are working very hard. I'm highly confident there'll be great treatments coming up soon, but they do have to go through the proper protocols before they're released. Let's go ahead to another question. Again, you're with Congressman Alex Mooney and guests. You may press star three to get into the question queue. We're beginning to round out the hour here, but please press star three if you want to get in the question queue to ask a question of me, Congressman Mooney, or one of our guests. We'll go here to uh, in Berkeley County, Martinsburg, where I'm sitting right now in Martinsburg, actually, and David's on the line. Go ahead, David. Good afternoon, Congressman. Um, I've got a question that concerns not just me, but a bunch of my friends. We're all self-employed. And I'm asking you this question because the government released additional monies for self-employed people for unemployment. It's been seven weeks without a check. We all filed originally, and nothing happened. We heard nothing. Then we found out we had a refile last Friday starting at 10 o'clock at night, which a bunch of us have done. Just wondering why it's taking so long to get us some money. Like I said, I've been out of work now for seven weeks without a paycheck. And I'd like to know if anything can be done to speed up the process. Well, uh, that's a very good question. And uh, the, the, the state runs the unemployment system. Uh, the unemployment system, the, the the funds shouldn't run out. Unemployment is an entitlement, so the funds are provided. They won't run out, per se. Uh, you have to get through the system and qualify. It sounds like that's where you're hitting trouble. That might be a, uh, someone, Paul Axelson or Senator Takubo at the state level could address that. Uh, Paul, do you want to try first? I can take a shot at it. It's a concern I've heard on conference calls, town halls. Across the mid-Atlantic states, there are some difficulties at the local employment agencies and getting programs in place. I do not know what is going on in West Virginia. I apologize. As for the money, the funding for it, it is available. It's funded through employment taxes. It's there. The extra money from the coronavirus relief legislation is also there. I just don't know what to tell you what, about what is specifically going on in the unemployment offices in the state of West Virginia. It's a common issue, hmm. however. I know that doesn't help but they're working through it as fast as they can. Okay. I would have just I would have thought that, you know, things would have just been kind of streamlined, like they're streamlining everything else. You know, cuz people are, are people are losing businesses, people people are running out of money, running out of food. Can't pay their bills. You know, when you go 7 weeks without right. without an income, it gets tough. Yeah, and small businesses are back on the economy, Dave. Go ahead. Go ahead, Tom. Is that Tom? Yeah, I just wanted to – you know, that hasn't been a a huge complaint I've been hearing down here in Charleston, so uh, it may be something particular with the application process or something that's being done, but if um, the Congress can could could maybe uh, forward me your information or something, contact information, I can certainly uh, reach out to you after the call and see if maybe there are just some – Something uh, maybe an error in the application process or something because that that is not what uh, what we're hearing from folks down here anyway in Charleston. The application I went through the application process and it came up said your application's you know gone through or whatever. It even gave me a weekly figure which didn't include the extra six hundred dollars which I didn't understand but it's like okay when do I get my money? <laughs> well. Thank you for pointing that out, David. Tell you what, I'm going to go ahead and, and repeat my number for you in Martinsburg, and then we can get your information and look into your specific situation. And anybody else listening on the call, uh, the Martinsburg District Office number is 264-8810, 264-8810. If you're in the Charleston area, uh, the number there is 925-5964, 925-5964. And we have heard some issues, and, and David, I want to thank you and anyone else listening Small businesses are the backbone of our economy. Uh, they're good, hardworking, tax-paying Americans, and I appreciate small businesses. So we certainly want to be helpful there as we want to help others as well. Uh, but I know small businesses you know, pay their bills differently than uh, people on payroll, so it's a different system. We've got to make sure they're being taken care of. So uh, please contact us with any problems. As I, may, I, said, may, I think I said earlier in the call, we move very, very fast with this program to get the money out as quickly as possible. As a result of that, however, there are 
uh, imperfections in the process. And David, that may be what you and some others have experienced, and we've gotten calls about it. But generally, they've been fixed, and it's generally working pretty well for most folks, from what I understand. Again, thanks for calling in. This is Congressman Alex Mooney. We're doing our live telephone town hall meeting. I uh, will suggest uh, we had one poll question. Press one on your phone. If you haven't voted yet, please press one on your phone. If you think it's time to reopen West Virginia now, press two on your phone. If you think we shouldn't open it now, reopen it gradually in coming uh, weeks and months. Let's go ahead to another question and uh, take as many as we can in the allotted time. Uh, we're going to go to uh, Upshur County, Buckhannon, and Catherine's on the line. Go ahead, Catherine. Hello, how are you? Uh, I was wondering when this ban is going to be lifted, or does anybody have any idea yet? Well, uh, that's a fair question. Go, let's go ahead and uh, see if we can address When is the ban going to be lifted so you can go outside again? I think I might engage Senator Takubo because that's really a uh, – the governor has declared a state of emergency, as every governor has. And in the case of an emergency, the governor can uh, assume powers, as the president can as well, in state of emergency uh, to, to decide that th those things unilaterally. I know he's issued a, a phase-out plan uh, as of – now, this week, uh, it's my understanding, you can eat restaurants outside only. In most counties, it's actually county by county as well. Uh, but, go ahead, uh, Senator Takubo, do you want to opine on that, when this epidemic will fade enough that we can open back up? Sure. I think the, this is a very fluid situation, and so the only way to know for sure is to keep assessing the situation day by day and watching what happens. So, for example, here at um, CMC, I haven't seen a positive COVID case in five, six days. Uh, no ICU cases, but not even not even uh, people on the floor. So hopefully, again, we've done a really good job in the state, and we've um, squashed this way down. Now, as people get out and about, you may see cases start back. And so the governor has uh, got a good uh, a, a bunch of people around him that's giving good advice uh, in the medical community, and we are watching this in public health very, very closely. The one thing we don't want to do is uh, put all this hard work that everybody's done for the past four to six weeks uh, to no good when a, new, a big outbreak occurs that we've been trying to avoid all along. So the only way to do that is to continue to watch closely, continue to monitor, continue to test, um, and as we see that as we continue to loosen guidelines and people get back to normal business, if we see that uh, we're getting away with it and people aren't getting sick and we're not seeing new cases, uh, you continue to wax those and hopefully we can get back to normal as quickly as possible. But anything we say right now would be a complete yes. So, for example, um, God forbid there would be a, a, a huge outbreak and all of a sudden a big surge of people getting sick, we would have to reverse and go back. Uh, so, the real answer to that question is, is uh, really a week-by-week -week assessment of how things are going. And there is um, the Senate meets regularly on calls, and we're hearing from constituents all over across you know, the state. Uh, we understand that we want the state back open just as quickly as we can get it back open, but we want to do it in a, as safe a manner as possible. So uh, we're very encouraged by what we're seeing, and uh, hopefully things can get back to normal soon. Thank you, Senator. Let's go to uh, Hampshire County, and we believe we have Dunlap on the line. Go ahead, Dunlap. Yes, sir. Hi, Representative Mooney. Hi. How are you doing? Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Yes. We okay. You just fine, Dunlap. Yep, go ahead. I've got a question for you concerned that herd immunity. I'm a retired public health person in epidemiology many years, and I keep hearing this bounced around about this herd immunity and since we don't know much about this thing, I got I got urged to call you. I don't want to bother you, but this thing bothered me because this herd immunity has a certain morbidity and mortality to it that we don't know. And by putting their entire uh, cadre of solutions on this herd immunity, I think it needs to be explained a little bit further, if you would, please, and see that, let people know, because I hear it around my community all the time that that's the solution to it. It really isn't, and you know, you know it isn't. But basically, also, I have another question about the availability of foodstuffs for seniors in this area without Internet, which is most of us single people in this county. We still can't get eggs in this county. 
We're still not able to see. We don't have a grocery store in this county whatsoever. We have uh, have to go to Virginia to do our shopping. You can imagine old geezers getting in their cars and going into Winchester, Virginia, because we live right west of where you are. And uh, I, I'm concerned about this, whether anything's been done, because the county commission hasn't made anything known about it. Thank you for your time. Thank, thank you. Those are two very good questions on the herd immunity. Let's try to address that one first. Uh, herd immunity and whether or not people think that'll work. Uh, Dr. Simmons, maybe you could address that, what the science is saying, what you're hearing about that. Sure. So herd immunity is the assumption that a specific portion of the population will either be vaccinated or exposed to a virus and recover. Herd immunity is dependent on the ability of the, com the community that's exposed to develop protective antibodies, again, through exposure or vaccination. We do not know currently, as I mentioned earlier, whether or not the antibodies produced by this virus are protective. Other coronaviruses do produce protective antibodies, but they um, wane very quickly. So I agree with you that herd immunity is probably not the best way to accomplish moving back out into business as usual. There are active, um, our Congress has done some pretty remarkable things about getting approval for new vaccines to be developed at quick and safely effect, uh, effective methods with uh, some local and federal legislation, I think our best bet for development of herd immunity will be a vaccine. So we're still months probably away. I would anticipate we wouldn't see a vaccine before early spring next year. So in order to get West Virginia back and acting as normally as we can, it's going to depend on people really observing good hygiene, respiratory hygiene, masking, social distancing, and I would not rely on herd immunity at this point. Thank you. And the second part of this question, I may ask maybe Kimberly Donahue to try to address that because you're working with the small businesses. And there was another question I won't have time to get to that was on here. Uh, one of the counties was having a hard time getting meat, I understood. They, they weren't able to get uh, meat products. And, and this, so the gentleman asked about eggs and perhaps other dairy and other products not being available in Hampshire County, which is like much of West Virginia, a large rural and beautiful county. Uh, but I don't know, Kimberly, if you thought you could address the availability of, are there any concerns in the in the food chain, availability of food products? Um, yes, we, we've seen some. It's particularly hard for, for smaller areas where they do not have a local grocery store. So, so we understand having to run over to uh, Winchester, Virginia. One of the things that you can do, though, is look locally and support some of your local farmers. For example, um, I'm way down in Lincoln County, but I live within 15 miles of people who not only provide chickens, um, you know, where they take care of everything and uh, the harvesting as well as eggs. Pretty much the only thing you can't get is, is milk, and soon our farmers' markets are going to start back up, and particularly with the senior supplement for those. Um, those are a really good place to get um, fresh vegetables, uh, fruits, and, and of course, uh, things like eggs. All righty. Uh, thank you. We Let's go ahead uh, and, and, and we're about to round up the hour. I think maybe we have time for one more. And we have John in Kanawha County. John, go ahead. Uh, yes, I believe that the coronavirus was uh, released by China for the world, but they protected their own people. And what are they uh, going to have them pay for? And another thing, I heard you mention something about the veterans. Uh, maybe receiving the benefit. Yes, yes, there was uh, veterans, uh, the $1,200 uh, benefit uh, to veterans. And uh, you can get that through the VA system. So contact the VA if you haven't already uh, to clarify on that one. And then you, can you re can you repeat your first question again? Uh, I believe that China protected their other provinces, but they released the virus upon the world. And I think that some way they should pay for this. Okay. Well, thank you uh, for that. I mean, as far as China's concerned, uh, you know, we'd like to work with, with anybody, but it, it is apparent from everything I've read and seen that uh, China allowed this to spread without giving us proper warnings up front. I'll have you know, I did sign a letter with a handful of members of Congress saying that the president should immediately halt any uh, funding uh, to this, this World Health Organization, WHO, 
uh, which is supposed to oversee this situation and, and oversee China, and they failed to do so. And I don't know why your tax dollars would go to a group that was covering for China. Uh, we need to hold China accountable for sure. We have – this is actually brought up to us in Congress and the House of Representatives and all of government a concern about having to rely on China far too much for our own good in this country. Uh, even some of the medicines, the pharmaceutical medicines we needed to treat the coronavirus – we're dependent upon China to get those things produced, the certain uh, chemicals and products we needed. We had to actually go to China to get it, and and we couldn't produce it domestically. Uh, of a lot of our trade imbalance with China, in addition to the, a lot of the debt of this country is bought by China. I think uh, as Americans, you know, West Virginians and all Americans, frankly, we need to re reconsider our relationship with China and our overdependence on China, bring those manufacturing jobs home as much as possible uh, to West Virginia and anywhere in America so we can produce our products here and be more self-sufficient. And, of course, Chinese is a, China still has a communist government uh, system. They do not believe in fairness or transparency. And a lot of the leaks that we understand have come out of China have been folks essentially rebelling against their own government and be willing, being willing to provide information hidden and, and destroyed and lied about. So we definitely need to hold China accountable here as we would any country that uh, acts in, a, in, in such a manner to as put at risk health, the health of other countries, and then try to destroy the evidence and hide and lie about it. So uh, that is a big issue, and, and, and if there's any silver lining to this, it may be that uh, most, most elected officials uh, will join. My, my efforts, my concerns have been for a long time about our over-reliance on China and our relationship with China. So thank you for that question, and th I want to thank all the uh, – all the uh, guests for joining today, this call. We uh, really had a great call. As you can see, a lot of folks are uh, interested in this issue. There's still a lot of confusion out there, despite the, basically the daily press briefings by the president and the governor and other good folks who are doing their very best. And I applaud our governor, Jim Justice, and I applaud certainly our president uh, for their strong leadership on this issue. Nonetheless, as uh, I think Senator Takubo mentioned, Every week the situation changes, and so what we're saying today could be slightly different in a week from now. Uh, so far, so good. The numbers have been low in West Virginia, and I think the governor has been wise to start to reopen, uh, but you know, not reopening fully. Uh, and actually, I say the results of the poll, it's a 25%, 75% split of those who participated in the online poll that I did today. 25% say open right now. And 75% say do not open right now, open gradually over coming you know, weeks and months. So um, most folks are uncomfortable reopening immediately right now based on, on that poll result. But I'm incredibly proud of the strength and reliance of our communities here in West Virginia. Uh, we should all be encouraged by the fact that West Virginians across our state are supporting, protecting, and standing by one another during this really tough time. As was discussed on the call, it's important to practice good hygiene, wash your hands, disinfect surfaces. If you're sick, stay home. Uh, I'll remain in continuous contact with President Trump and his administration and the, and the federal agencies. As was stated on this call, they've been very responsive and doing a good job. Uh, the West Virginia Department of Health and Human Resources has set an information hotline for the coronavirus concerns. The number there is 1-800-887-4304, one 887 Four three zero four. Do not hesitate to reach out to them. CDC.gov, Centers for Disease Control, CDC.gov has all the latest information. I'll continue to do what I can to combat this epidemic and fight to protect you and your family. And finally, there are a lot of folks. I could, sorry, I couldn't get to every call. There was many on here. Uh, a lot of them had to deal with specific cases about, again, getting your check from the IRS or the small business concerns. You may call our office directly if we didn't get a chance to get to you. Your question, Charleston office for the Kanawha County area is 304-925-5964, 304-925-5964. If you live in uh, Eastern Panhandle area, the Martinsburg office is 304-264-8810, uh, 264-8810. We also have a full-time staffer who uh, works out of Randolph County. You can call either of those numbers and uh, we'll, we'll get someone in touch with you. Uh, thank you for the uh, privilege to represent you in Washington, D.C. Again, this is Congressman Alex Mooney wishing you uh, Godspeed and, and be safe.